Yes, so I am not John Pascal Barrow, by the way, if you're looking at your programs there. Um, I wanted to uh, start our story here um, before I get right into the experiment with um, when California state parks in this area really got into managing second growth, and that was in the early 2000s when we bought about uh, or acquired about 10,000 hectares of second growth in Del Norte County and the Mill Creek property, which is now part of Redwood National and State Parks. And um, because we were kind of almost starting from scratch, really, we, we talked to a lot of uh, researchers and practitioners in the area, trying to explore um, what our priorities would should be should be and how we would go about treating those areas. And um, so as you can imagine, the conversations turned pretty quickly to variable density thinning. Uh, to promote verse, diversity in late seral habitat, things you'd think a park would be interested in. But I was a little bit surprised at um, some of the conversations I'd had here in Western Washington before coming here as well, and that for a lot of people, um, this idea of variable density thinning in really young stands like we're seeing here, well, it sounds really complicated and expensive. And should we really be worrying about that at such an early stage? You know, these stands, what we're most worried about is growth, right, and forest health. Uh, so maybe we should just do some kind of basic thinning, come back in uh, a number of years for a commercial thinning, uh, and introduce heterogeneity then. Maybe even uh, you can sell some saw logs to help pay for your added costs of doing these more complex prescriptions. Um, but I, I felt like that was, um, that we could do a little better than that, and um, I think the rest of us in the state parks kind of agreed. So, uh, but we did look at what the uh, timber company had been doing for pre-commercial thinning in this area and what others were doing, and we thought we'd use that as kind of a, a guide to see if we can use it as a template to develop uh, something more appropriate to the goals of uh, California state parks. And so with that, um, our first treatment we came up with was called the high density thin. And basically, we're thinning trees to about a five meter spacing. We're, that's more or less plus or minus two meters or so, or a meter or two, um, in order to create some variability with this, within the stand, but also to choose the best tree. But instead of choosing the biggest and the tree with the best growth potential, we were more interested in looking and preserving redwoods and other minor species to promote the uh, composition that was there pre-logging. Uh, we also decided not to thin uh, the redwood stump sprouts, figuring that that's not only adding to the variability within the stand, but it's also hedging our bets against the bear damage that we figured we were likely to get. Um, we also decided to leave some brush and small trees, especially tan oaks, as a way to uh, make a little bit more variability in the stand and to, to add a lot of noise to the data, too, to make it a little harder to uh, uh, analyze. Um, but it still felt like, but we also realized that this was pretty similar to a traditional uh, pre-commercial thin. And if it was really similar, we knew we might end up with something like this. And that is, um, in a few years, we'd end up with a fairly homogenous stand little understory structure and um, a closed canopy. We got some good growth out of it, but we need to do some more work. Well, we all know what to do if you're worried about the canopy closing too quickly, right? You do a heavier thin when you're in there in the, in the beginning. So our next treatment we came up with, we call the low density thin. And we're, again, we're just adding to the spacing between trees about six meters or so on average. But this still, both of these felt a little bit like variable density thinning light to me. Not that we aren't creating some heterogeneity in there, but I was hoping we could do a little bit better than that um, and while still keeping the cost down. Of course, we couldn't go in there and mark any of this timber, uh, except maybe for some little uh, sample marks. We needed to have the person with the saw choosing what tree to leave behind. So for this, we called the treatment the localized release. And what the Sawyer has to do is imagine a circle that's about 15 meters in diameter. You take all but the three best trees within that circle. 
cut everything else down by the same criteria we were talking about before. Then you, you leave a tree at your back and you go cut another circle adjacent to it. And then uh, you repeat this as many times as you can. You want to really pack those circles into the uh, stand as closely together as you can with just leaving a tree or a row of a tree between these circles. You're going to do a light thinning in between two circles, and then you leave alone where two, three or four circles come together. So we've got a series of skip areas and more heavily thinned areas, and no spacing whatsoever within the circles themselves. Um, now, this is not the tidiest prescription you've ever seen, as you can imagine. Um, there are times when the Sawyers lose a little track of where their circle is going to be in relation to the neighbor's circles. Uh, so you have to have some little caveats in there. Um, occasionally, we find that uh, these skip areas get a little bigger than we had planned. So you have to be able to be ready to send folks back in there to either create extra circles or do some kind of other thinning in there uh, uh, to avoid the skip areas. The other, and the thing that we're kind of relying on here is we're hoping that we can have some trees kind of establish dominance in the, within the stand and that it will, it will promote some self-thinning of the stand because we're still t stuck with some pretty high density stands uh, in this case, right? Um, and what we've found so far is that at least um, as far as implementation, we've found the localized release is much more efficient to treat, which makes sense, right? Because you've got these skip areas where you're doing nothing. You're not treating 100% of any one stand. Uh, so that kind of made sense. Um, I wanted to give you a, a, the bigger picture of where we are. This is in uh, the Mill Creek portion of Del Norte Coast Redwood State Park, uh, just east of Crescent City in Del Norte County. And uh, if you look at all the different colored polygons within uh, this picture here, each of those colors represents a different thinning prescription. And so not only are we trying to create variability within each stand, but we're creating variability at the landscape scale to more uh, closely resemble natural conditions. Uh, unfortunately, um, for, for, well, for today's talk, we're only going to look at three of these prescriptions and controls, and there's certainly others um, that we don't have any dollars for monitoring. But we did come up with an experimental design to, do, to look at what we're doing at a programmatic scale. Uh, so we randomly assigned these treatments within blocks. There was a couple of controls that were not randomly placed, though. Um, we did three plots per treatment. Each plot was a quarter hectare in size, other than a little bit smaller for the controls. Uh, and we repl replicated that five times for a total of 60 plots. The plots were established right after treatment, and then we remeasured them four years later. And here's where those plots, uh, or the, where the blocks are. They range from stands that were, had very few redwoods and mostly Douglas fir to stands that were much more heavily into uh, redwood. Uh, so our basic questions were, how did these treatments expect species composition, stand density, and structural diversity? How fast did the trees grow? How many trees sustained bear damage? And how deep was the slash? How big of a problem was that? We're also going to do some work on understory light and vegetation, but uh, we're not ready to report any of those results yet. So our first result, we found that the low density thinning was best at promoting redwood and reducing the number of, uh, or the basal area of uh, Douglas firs. And all the minor species seem to be fairly well retained within all treatments. We also found that the lower, low density treatment Treatment was the best at reducing tree numbers and basal area. And bear damage was pretty much everywhere. But they certainly, bears prefer redwoods, and they prefer stands that have been thinned. Um, with, as far as the Douglas firs go, we did find that they were more likely to be damaged in the low-density treatment. But what does that mean? Um, you know, a little bit of bear damage can actually add some structural diversity as well as some decadence to a stand, so it can be seen as a good thing, right? And as you can see in this picture, redwoods are pretty darn good at healing over from bear damage. So it's hard to know if this tree is going to recover or not, uh, or if repeated bear damage 
or some other causes will be exacerbated by the bear damage and it'll lead to, to the mortality of the tree. So, uh, but one thing I think we can agree on is uh, measuring diameter at breast height on these trees can be a little confusing because, you know, the trees may shrink because of the lack of bark in some pieces, right? So let's just look at the redwood trees that were not damaged here for a minute, okay? Uh, average size of undamaged redwoods was highest, higher and more variable within localized release prescription. Basal area increment was greatest and more variable in the localized release. And if you just look at the largest trees, uh, the, the basal area and diameter growth was greatest in the redwoods in the localized release. And for the Douglas fir, it was greatest in the high density treatment. Um, we also took photos of slash depth to get an idea of what the slash was doing and how much of a fire danger it is. You can see four years after, the slash is certainly breaking down pretty well. Um, we did want to quantify it a little bit. Um, we found that it's highly variable, but it did tend to be a little bit higher in the localized release. Made a little bit of sense since um, some of the trees may have been getting hung up on the, these uh, unfinned clumps, perhaps. But it's breaking down in all of our treatments. So in summary, the uh, slash fuel, while it's greatest in the localized release and followed by the low density, it's breaking down everywhere. But let's keep in mind that these control stands have their own type of fire hazard, right? So this is just one measurement of fire danger. Uh, bear damage was highest among redwoods in the localized release in the low density treatments. And in dug fir, it was highest in the low density treatment. I uh, like this graph that Pascal put together for us. Uh, compositional shift towards redwood was greatest in the low density treatment, followed by the localized release. Structural diversity, greatest in the localized release. Um, redwood growth measured by diameter or by basal area was greatest in the localized release. And finally, efficiency was greatest was, it was most efficient to implement the localized release prescription. So with that, that led us to the conclusion that at least in the short term, we are, we've been able to create more complexity in these stands without the added costs that are sometimes associated with variable density thinning. And with that, I'm ready for questions as well. Yeah. <laughs> Um, what kind of machines were taping? Oh, that's right, it's getting taped. Oh, I should get closer to the mic then, huh? Sure, sorry about that. What kind of machinery and process, processes were used in the harvest there? So this is all um, pre-commercial thinning, so it's just people with chainsaws. We, uh, we left everything on the ground that we thinned, yeah. So what were the age of the stands you were working in? And have you, uh, how long ago was it? So you went back four years. Do you have any more data that's more recent? Or was that just four years ago you did the project? So um, the stands were between 11 and 24 years old at the time of treatment. Um, and we've kind of staggered this implementation out over a four-year period. So um, we're, we're just starting the remeasurements after 10 years right now, but we won't finish that for another four or five years because of the way we staggered. Like we treat kind of one block per year and measure that block right after treatment. So it takes a while to get to all, flop, all five blocks done. Yeah. It was hard to tell from the photos. Did you limb the, when you left the three trees standing? Did you clean up, clean them up and limb them? No, up? not at all. Why we, not? Why not? Because um, it's we're not too worried about it. I mean, we're not. Our, we don't have a goal of trying to make clean bowls for future uh, saw logs. You know, we'll just see what happens to them. Let them uh, develop naturally. Um, when you left the thin material on the ground, did that have to do with ecology um, rules because you're a state or national park? And then the follow-up would be, 
for restoration, what would be the best practice in terms of all that material on the ground? Well, um, because the trees, again, were small enough, they, there wasn't really any merchantable value in them anyway. We were rarely cutting things over 12 inches in diameter. Um, from an ecological perspective, um, you know, there's certainly some advantages to leaving coarse woody debris on the ground, on the forest floor. Um, in the smaller diameter classes, people don't tend to get quite as excited about it. But as we move into um, larger age classes, which we hope to do fairly soon, it's certainly possible that we would be removing uh, logs off the property as long as we were able to be clear that um, the ecology was considered first. And if that we needed to leave coarse wood for habitat purposes, and that would obviously take priority over selling saw logs to either to help pay for the project or to um, go off to the state coffer somewhere or something like that. So yeah. I have a question maybe more relevant to the uh, thinnings of larger size classes than the um, you know less than 24 but or less than 12 maybe is what you said. Mm -hmm. uh, are there permits that go along with the restoration thinning uh, needed on um, on the park, like Abs a CEQA compliant document prior to the treatment? Absolutely. We go through, um, you know, CEQA on all our projects like this. Now, if, if we were thinning an older stand, we wouldn't do a THP per se. But, um, you know, as, a T as, you, as mo many of you may know, a THP is the CEQA is the CEQA equivalent, right? So we'd still have to do the same CEQA process that a THP would, but we wouldn't call it a THP because we're state parks and we're not doing it to, to uh, sell saw logs. But this, yeah, but these are um, all done under two different mitigated negative declarations, um, you know, with the full 30-day review and everything else. So are the same public trust agencies involved as would be in a THP, and, and who's the lead on the negative declaration? Uh, State Parks is the lead, and yes, we did pull in, you know, we DFW, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, all those agencies were quite familiar with the project, and we let them know before we uh, made our MND public in case they wanted to comment on, on it and have us tweak it before it went public. But, but they've actually been very supportive of what we're doing and are interested to hear what we're going to do with the older stands, which, again, is our kind of our next step. Did uh, you see a decrease in bear damage with an increase in the depth of the slash? No, I've heard a lot of speculation that that might happen. Um, but the only thing I think um, we've seen a little bit, and it's maybe a little preliminary, is that, um, you know, in some other studies we've seen that the higher, you, the more you thin, the more likely you are to see bear damage, like the heavier the thin. But I think maybe a better way to think of it is the faster the tree is growing, the more likely you are to get bear damage. So you've got to account for not only um, the density of the stand around the individual tree, but the site quality as well. So in other words, you know, a heavier thinning or a higher site quality area is more likely to get damaged by bears. And that um, there was another one um, that um, tried to look at distance from roads and stuff, and that we haven't found a great correlation other than how well the trees are growing. That seems to be the, our best guess as to where the bears are coming. But on the top note, it seems like most of our damage came almost immediately after treatment, and it seems to be um, that while they go and damage extra trees later, they don't tend to, um, the, the bulk of your bear damage comes pretty rapidly after treatment. Now we just wonder how many of them are going to actually die from it, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, ladies. That was great.